Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Paul Pinsky. After an introduction like that, there's nowhere to go but down. <laughs> and if you add the fact that I'm standing between you and lunch, I'm really in trouble. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was uh, late uh, in arriving and I only heard the last couple of presentations, so I do want to apologize in advance if I repeat some uh, earlier stated facts or, or information. Um, thank you for um, being here and sitting through that introduction. And, um, and being people who are committed to uh, making a, a major change uh, in our energy in the state and hopefully our country. Um, you know well we have an environmental problem, uh, despite those deniers uh, who remain and get too much uh, visibility and publicity. Um, you know, over the last three years, maybe three and a half years, when we had hit a high point with a lot of positive energy on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, we've seen uh, a fall in that because of a few incidents and uh, the right wing giving a lot of space and time to the, these deniers. And uh, we have to regain the momentum and the high ground. So that's also off script, but w that's really something very important to us. You know, the old hypothesis about um, the collapse of the gigantic uh, ice sheets in uh, Greenland and Antarctica you know, over the thousands of years said, well, maybe during the, um, the 21st century we might have six or seven inches of, um, of sea level rise. Um, but as you know, and m many of you know much better than I, the new hypothesis, the new data shows that's way out of whack. Um, you've seen the numbers, you've heard the numbers, uh, three feet, uh, if nothing is done, and maybe as much as six feet we've heard, and who knows? You know, there are lots of scientists who can pick the ones you think are more accurate in their models. Um, but there is a new hypothesis, um, and clearly it would affect the United States, it would affect our own state, and God forbid what would happen in Asia, uh, the millions of people who would be displaced if, if the worst came, came to fruition. I mean, millions of people in the lowlands, uh, uh, it would be horrible, and that's if nothing is done. But we're here because we're going to do something. Maryland took a, a major step forward about a year and a half ago, and actually about a year and eight uh, months ago, uh, in fact, with the help of many people in this room, uh, we were able to pass the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act. We passed legislation that put us with about five other states, leading with California, to go on record of having not an aspirational goal, but a firm goal on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We did that, one, because we didn't trust the speed in which Congress would move. Two, we did it, in fact, to move Congress with the idea of more states acted in a local level, statewide level, it would put pressure on the federal government. You know, some people said, well, wait for Congress to act. <laughs> Lucky for us, we ignored that. Um, no, absolutely. No. There are absolutely real lessons in this, you know, and we said, well, you know, two years ago, whenever the House passed the legislation, albeit not in the form we would like, we said, well, maybe it's coming around. And, and obviously in the last couple of months, we see that it's taken a, a, a deep drop. Um, so it clearly re reaffirms that idea that the states have to act and act aggressively. So we did that with the Greenhouse Gas Emissions uh, Act. And it calls for a 25% reduction by the year 2020. There has to be a plan in place by 2012. Also, the state passed Renewable Portfolio um, Standards, RPS, uh, and that says by 2022, I think, and Malcolm knows this better than I, and you'll be hearing from him in a moment, we have to have 20% uh, uh, use of renewables by the companies that are supplying energy. The state's not going to meet these goals, these mandates, without an aggressive, uh, even radical change in how we generate energy in Maryland. I don't think we're going to meet it unless there's a major, major change in terms of uh, RPS. I think we may in terms of the um, uh, greenhouse gas reductions. And I might also add that the penalties, if you don't meet it, are sadly, sadly very small. And it's probably more likely that these companies will pay the penalty 
than buy and create the alternative clean energy. If you can buy your way out of a problem, we're not solving the problem. Will the challenges be met? Well, I think more importantly, there's a more important question, that is, are they enough? And I don't think so. To be frank, while these laws are very important, and obviously I was involved with many of these reforms, as well as uh, you, um, they're far from su sufficient in many, many ways. Um, they were the result of negotiations. Oh, slow down, please. Um, <laughs> result in negotiations, um, transactions, if you will. They were pushing at the edges. Um, we can't hope they were met, or they're going to be met. We have to push harder. We have to think bigger. We need to call for transformation. I heard Mike use that term earlier, and I want to come back to that, of how we think, how we operate, and also how we produce energy. Playing around the edges isn't enough. It is not enough. Someone said we need not one block, but 100 blocks. But you in the audience, and I don't know all of you, I know some of you who are consumers, who are advocates, who work in the alternative energy field, uh, need to lead that push, need to lead that trans transformation in thinking. Because if not you, who? We can't stand on the sidelines. We must reduce the dependency. And we know the, there are other options, uh, energy efficiency, but clearly that brings us to why we're here today, and that's uh, offshore wind. Um, we can do it in the United States. We can do it here in Maryland. We've seen it in Europe. You've seen the numbers. You've seen statistics. Um, Europe already has uh, 2,300 megawatts, 500,000 homes installed. Another 100,000 are, uh, are under planning. And their goals would knock your socks off. And this is a statistic. European Union and the Wind Energy Association of Europe has set a target of 40 gigawatts by 2020, 150 gigawatts by 2030. Even China has a target of 20 gigawatts. And as you've heard also here in Maryland, the US Department of Energy says we have outstanding energy resources. You've heard all the figures of why we need to put it here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Maryland has to lead by example. Just like we did by the greenhouse gas emission, like California did with the Clean Cars Act, states have to lead by example, by action. Um, as I said, we can't rely on Congress. It's clear to me that the models have to come from the states, and that includes offshore wind energy. Um, but there are many challenges and obstacles remaining in our way. The business model, as you've heard, and probably many of you are familiar, calls for an understanding that if you're going to make a big investment up front, there's a commitment over a number of years to recoup your investment. Right now, the energy companies, they buy on the spot market. They control the market. They don't need to have 10, 20, or 30-year contracts. But if, if Blue Water Wind or Cape Wind 